Good evening, everyone. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to this uh, Brookings Doha Center panel event. What's next for uh, Yemen's tragic war? Uh, we're now entering, uh, the, well, we've entered the fourth year of this absolutely devastating war in Yemen uh, that has produced some really astonishing statistics um, due to the man-made uh, humanitarian catastrophe in the country. Uh, 20 million Yemenis are in need of humanitarian assistance. 7 million Yemenis are on the brink of famine. Um, and in 2017 alone, uh, 50,000 children died as a result of hunger and disease. Uh, 18 million Yemenis uh, don't know where their next meal will come from. And of course, there are millions displaced, millions of children out of school, uh, tens upon thousands died, um, and many have disappeared. UNICEF estimates that one Yemeni child under the age of five dies every 10 minutes from preventable causes. So by the time this panel is over tonight, at least nine Yemeni children will have died as a result of this war. So, I mean, this, for all these reasons, um, it has been described as uh, the world's worst humanitarian crisis since World War II. Now, of course, in the meantime, we have uh, seen some recent political developments that point to an escalation in, in the war. Uh, of course, in December 2017, uh, former Yemeni President Ali Abdullah Saleh was killed uh, in retaliation for breaking his alliance with the Houthis. And uh, just a couple of weeks ago, we've seen the, the political leader of the Houthis killed by the Arab coalition. Uh, and ballistic missiles fired into Saudi Arabia by the Houthis. So um, uh, three years on, uh, Operation Decisive Storm, it seems, has been far from decisive. Um, so I'm, I'm delighted to introduce our panel tonight, who each of whom have traveled uh, very far and wide. So thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, to my left here is uh, Mr. Bara Sheban who is a Middle East and North Africa caseworker at the UK-based NGO Reprieve. And prior to that, he was the Yemen Project Coordinator investigating drone strikes in Yemen. Uh, Barat was also a youth representative at the National Dialogue Conference in Yemen. And uh, he also participated in the peace talks in Sana'a uh, with the Houthi movement before March 2015. So welcome. Uh, to Barat's left, we have Dr. El Abed El Abed, who is the um, uh, United Nations representative of the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights in Yemen. And prior to this, uh, he was the head of the UN Human Rights and Documentation Center for Southwest Asia and the Arab region here in Qatar. That must be the <laughs> longest title of an institution ever. Um, and prior to joining the United Nations, Dr. Labid was, uh, he taught international human rights law and Islamic law at McGill University in Canada. Welcome. And last but not least, we have Dr. Elizabeth Kendall, who is a senior research fellow in Arabic and Islamic studies at Pembroke College at Oxford University. Um, she examines how militant jihadist movements win local audiences and exploit traditional Arab cultures. And in the last four years, uh, she has served as a pro bono international advisor to a cross-tribal council in eastern Yemen uh, that promotes social and political cohesion as a counterweight to the expansion of Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula and ISIS. Um, Dr. Kendall is also the author and editor of several books, including Reclaiming Islamic Tradition and 21st Century Jihad. Uh, so each panelist will speak for 10 minutes, uh, after which I will ask a couple of questions to kickstart the discussion, and, and then we will uh, take questions from the audience for what I'm sure will be a very rich discussion. So without further ado, Barat, you have the floor. Thank you, Noha. Um, thanks for um, everyone here for having uh, an, uh, uh, an interest in, uh, in the um, uh, situation in Yemen. As it's um, unfolding, as Noha mentioned, it's been uh, more, than, uh, more than three years in this conflict. But for many Yemenis, they feel like it's, um, it's, uh, it's a more of a process of that has taken seven years in transition that they still don't know what the future uh, what the future looks like. 
Um, and um, moving, talking about that, um, a transition in, um, the Arab, uh, in the Arab world, which is a region that is not familiar really with, uh, with political transition, was, I think, one of the main challenges uh, facing Yemen after the um, uh, Arab Spring revolutions in, um, in 2000 and, uh, 2011. Yemen, although was not a, a, um, a typical um, um, uh, uh, military um, um, uh, um, Arab dictatorship um, uh, rule or regime, so there was some level of political participation by political parties. There is some freedom of press. There is some um, process of consultation between um, uh, uh, tribal leaders and the regime in the, in, the, in the center. But I think the main phenomena that Yemen has with all the countries that um, were hit by the um, uh, protests or the, the, uh, the, Arab, uh, the, the Arab Spring revolutions is that Yemen, like many other um, republics in the Arab world, don't have a framework of political transition. And I think this has been, was the main phenomenon, main challenge for uh, the Yemeni people after 2011. It's a, a country, like many other countries in the Arab world, ruled by one person, one family, one system, one tribe for more than three decades. Eventually, when you have that process going on for long and, and ongoing and ongoing, there is then this difficulty, how can they move and how that could be shift uh, when you don't have institutions. The institutions are basically uh, people, persons who are, have been uh, ruling the country uh, at the, in, the, and the, uh, in, the, uh, in the capital. So in Yemen, um, in uh, 2006, we had the first um, uh, presidential elections where actually the political parties named a political candidate to run against Ali Abdullah Saleh, which was weird in the, in the, in the instance inside Yemen that having a candidate who is willing to, uh, uh, to uh, challenge the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the president, but it did set a precedent for the Yemeni people that maybe it's time for change. And I think 2006 was the beginning of moving until 2011 the protests in 2011, uh, uh, 2011 uh, came. Um, the, uh, the, the events of 2011, and I think this is another, uh, another uh, discussion that always happened inside Yemen, is that what caused the 2011? Was it the circumstances, or were there political players, or actually were there regional, uh, uh, regional factors, or there was m maybe some form of conspiracy that uh, was conspiring against the Arab world that happened uh, eventually, that there were protests happening in multiple countries at the same, uh, at the same time? I think in Yemen, uh, the circumstances were fertile, very fertile, for a big political change. Um, inside uh, the country, there was a civil society that is struggling and trying to uh, redefine the political framework. There are political parties that are not able to actually make uh, the political change they are supposed to be as their role as political uh, parties. And you have a regime that is based basically on patronage. Um, focusing power around the very specific people. And the phenomena about Saleh's regime in the last year is that he was concentrating power in the hands of direct family members, which angered, of course, many segments of the Yemeni, um, of the Yemeni, uh, of the Yemeni, uh, Yemeni society. Um, it didn't lead, although the protests didn't lead to a total overthrow of the Saleh regime, but it led to something called the GCC Initiative, which basically is another frame of transitional of a transitional uh, transitional framework. So there are many uh, flaws, of course, in, the, in that uh, in the tra in the uh, GCC initiative, which was led by Saudi uh, uh, Saudi Arabia. And I think I will uh, let Mr. Al Obaid he will talk about the issue, the main issue about the um, the main challenge. I think was within the GCC initiative that it granted Saleh immunity with nothing much in uh, nothing much in exchange. Um, but the main phenomena about the GCC initiative that it did set a clear roadmap into where we were in 2011 and saying this is where things should be um, in, the coming, uh, in the coming elections, which I think is another challenge facing the circumstances, uh, the, the, the challenge situation today. We are in a conflict today, not because 
the, uh, there is uh, basically uh, people fighting because the transition that was supposed to lead to a, a, a <coughs> political transition uh, didn't complete its process. The there is no uh, an alternative transition happening right now, or there is no uh, parallel political discussion happening right now, saying this is an alternative to the conflict that is happening, which make the options for many of the Yemeni people very, very, uh, very, very slim. Um, when you don't have a framework of how power and how the wealth will be redistributed. Uh, things then, uh, we're taking an interesting uh, turn of events during the national, uh, during the national, uh, the national dialogue, and uh, in the national dialogue, the main, um, I think, the main um, core, uh, 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 core resolutions or core outcomes of the national dialogue was first that Yemen should change from being a central form of governance to a federal form of, gov of, of governance. So moving Yemen from the previous shape or the previous form towards federalism. The second is that we need a transitional justice process that can lead the country and hopefully um, prevent uh, Yemen falling into another cycle of, uh, cycle of uh, violence. Third is the military, uh, the, uh, military and security reconstruction. Of course, the national dialogue did end and the, um, uh, uh, the participants did manage to draft the first draft of the, um, of the uh, Yemeni constitution, but the main change of events happened when the Houthis um, uh, took control over Sana'a in 2014. And I think that changed the entire dynamics of the, uh, of the, uh, uh, the political struggle on the, on the ground, moving the transition from purely a political transition into an armed, um, into an armed, uh, into an armed conflict. During the national dialogue, there were many groups involved, uh, multiple discussions happening. And I think this is another form of what we are missing today in the current situation inside, uh, inside Yemen. We had discussions, we had tribal leaders coming up from across the country, coming into Sana'a to discuss and tell their grievances. And that's why one of the main resolutions was that Yemen needs to change from a central form of governance to, uh, to, uh, to federalism. Uh, there were discussions with even militants groups, including even Al-Qaeda, where, they f where the, 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 the discussions in the transitional justice was, can we include all militants group into a form of transition uh, that would uh, allow inclusivity and participation um, without the need to actually uh, go into direct armed confrontation every time the state uh, faces, a, uh, faces a, uh, a, a challenge. Um, but again, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, the change of events by the Houthis taking control over the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the capital Sana'a meant that the Houthis opened, um, um, uh, basically changed the dynamics into uh, they can dictate how this political transition should look like. So it's no longer how did the members of the National Dialogue really discuss or what did they agree about, it's how um, any armed group um, uh, is able to uh, enforce uh, a, certain, uh, uh, a certain deal or whatever they felt their, their grievances was uh, against the uh, rest of the Yemeni, uh, the rest of the Yemeni, uh, Yemeni factions. Uh, two final points I wanna, I wanna, I wanna, I wanna stress uh, about. The other, the other uh, uh, challenge also faced Yemen, that the success of the transition in Yemen uh, was mainly hindering about Yemen moving away from the regional rivalry between Saudi Arabia and Iran. Uh, unfortunately, because of the events after September 2014, we also missed that chance, because if Yemen had been left alone out of this rivalry between Saudi Arabia and Iran, maybe Yemeni people will be able to discuss their differences just, in, uh, just, uh, just internally. Um, and uh, 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 finally, I would like to, 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 to say, the third um, and final challenge still facing is that uh, the military reconstruction inside Yemen never really happened. Uh, Saleh was able to push uh, big segments of the Yemeni military to align with the, uh, with, the, uh, with, the, uh, with the Houthis. When that happened, 
the Houthis did have access into many military camps and weaponry stocks that they did not uh, have, in the, uh, have in the past. It meant simply that the Houthis don't need really to abide by the agreement, by the National Dialogue Agreement, if they can enforce their will. They did then move after that towards the south of the country, and I think this also uh, led to uh, more, um, uh, more uh, grievances coming from many parts of the country uh, towards, the, uh, uh, towards especially the north of the country, where many people felt that the north of the country have ruled uh, the Yemeni state for a long time. And this uh, kind of feeling of grievance came from especially from people in central Yemen and south uh, Yemen, and it's still shaping itself today. Uh, many people are afraid that if any coming deal um, uh, comes by, that they will go back to the same form of governance, where they're being ruled uh, from, uh, from Sana'a, where the circumstances on the, on the ground actually doesn't, uh, d doesn't, um, doesn't allow it to, uh, doesn't allow it to, uh, to, um, uh, to happen. Of course, the, the, uh, the uh, events are moving, things are changing, even in a conflict that is, um, that is uh, uh, where the situation is, seems like it's uh, uh, stuck and there is a form of sto uh, a stalemate like the uh, Yemeni conflict, um, Saleh's death did change the course uh, where many, uh, many uh, uh, northern tribes felt for, this, for the first time since the beginning of the, uh, the Saudi-led intervention that they can find um, uh, um, other alliances, they can find solutions somewhere, uh, somewhere else. Um, so it could play into the favor of the, of the, um, of the, uh, of the Arab coalition and the, Yemeni, uh, and the Yemeni government. However, the coalition is still internal differences also pose another challenge against, uh, the, uh, the, against itself and against, of course, the Yemeni government, especially that rivalry between the UAE and the, uh, and the Yemeni government. And if uh, anyone has been following the news lately, you're gonna see what's happened in uh, the Sukhothra Island just, uh, just a, few, uh, uh, a few days ago. Um, I think I'll stop here, and then I'll leave the uh, rest of the points for the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Um, let me first, I'm gonna focus primarily on uh, human rights issues in Yemen. And uh, because that's what I do, and I also work and live currently in Sana'a, so um, that's what I'm very familiar with. Um, as Noha said, I'm the representative of the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights to Yemen, and, uh, but I'm here speaking on my own personal capacity, so whatever I'm saying is, is, is basically my professional view on how things are going in Yemen. Um, uh, the second thing that I, I want to highlight is that I, I know a lot of people are frustrated with uh, many of the UN political entities, such as the Security Council and, and, and so on and so forth. I just want to mention that I'm not a representative of those political entities. I work for a technical aspect of the United Nations, and that's the Office of the High Commissioner uh, for Human Rights. Um, our work is primarily focused on um, the victims of uh, any conflict in the world. And in the case of Yemen, uh, the work we do primarily focuses on documenting uh, massive human rights violations during uh, the conflict. And our mandate is based on very neutral normative grounds, mainly international law of human rights, international humanitarian law, and other aspects of international law. We are not um, uh, interested in, in some of the political arguments or uh, feedback and, and, and so on and so forth. Um, so far, we, we do produce an annual report that goes to the Human Rights Council, and our last report last year uh, succeeded in generating more interest, and, and now we have a group of eminent experts who have been tasked by the Human Rights Council to further investigate the situation in Yemen and report this year in terms of actually some of those more serious human rights violations. Um, as I'm coming here, I think a lot of you have noticed that there is a, quite an alarming intensification of the conflict. The frequency of missiles sent into Saudi Arabia has increased and also the frequency of airstrikes 
uh, into um, Yemeni territory has also increased. And as a result, of, uh, I think we reach a point in the conflict that it has really been uh, quite intense. And I would say since uh, September of last year, um, uh, the conflict went through uh, constant escalation. And as a result, I think there are more civilians now uh, being victimized by the conflict, extreme forms being killed to displacement, to injuries, to destruction of uh, civilian uh, properties. But I wanted to highlight first some of the normative backdrop to human rights in Yemen, because I think it plays into the conflict fairly well. Uh, the first issue I want to highlight is before the war, as you mentioned, there was an erosion of the state and institutions. So there was a personalization of everything, uh, including, uh, including the, 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 the state and, and including the monopoly over the use of power. I think that's the most important thing. When that becomes synonymous with one individual and, or one family, that becomes uh, quite an issue. What that did in Yemen is that it created a number of grievances that were not addressed. They were let, left to fester until they became some really serious sources of the conflict. The typical example would be the, uh, the, the issues relating to the South uh, and, and what happened after 1994 war uh, and the injustice that had been inflicted on the southern part of the country. The other issue will be the Houthis uh, during the six wars that they fought against uh, Saleh, uh, the second factor. I think the third factor, which you alluded to, there's a very long history of lack of accountability. Uh, and I think we've seen that in, in relation to the amnesty law that was drafted uh, and uh, came as a result of the GCC initiative. And that was a quid pro quo for Saleh stepping down and also for eventually at the time enacting the transitional justice law. Now, our office at the time objected quite strongly to granting amnesty because that would open the door for uh, basically people doing what the previous regime, the Saleh regime, did in the country. And I think, sadly, we proved to be right. Because I think that's one of the factors that led to the conflict, is the fact that actually those who committed serious human rights violations in Yemen felt empowered to be part of the new power, if you wish, arrangements, and as a result, felt no pressure of being accountable to what happened uh, in the past. The fourth point is that we now have a, a very, very strange reality on the ground. We have the official government, and we have the de facto government. The official government being the one that is, uh, had his government, which is the official representative of the sovereignty. In other words, those are the ones that will represent Yemen in the international community, and those are the ones that who can affect legal obligations on behalf of Yemen. Now, those do not necessarily have an awful lot of control on the ground. And the evidence for that is, if you look at the South, there is a complete absence of law and order or security in the southern part of the country. Uh, on the other hand, you have a de facto government which controls the northern parts, which exerts more effective control, but is also very repressive. Uh, uh, as a government, and also it's very clear beyond any uh, yeah, shadow of a doubt that they cannot rule the entire country because of the ideology and the makeup and all of that uh, kind of uh, factors. And this led somewhat, and uh, sorry, and both governments are not inclusive, by the way. They're exclusive. Uh, and, and I think the result of that. Yemen now go, is going through an extreme form of polarization. There is a language now has been articulated in the last two or three years in Yemen where actually all those who are in the north and support the Houthis, they are Safavis or they are Farsis or they are Iranians, and all of those who are against the Houthis are Daeshi and Qaeda and ISIS and, and, and so on and so forth. And those are labels that actually have been articulated more frequently, and I think 
as a result, those, and you know better than this, you, you are Yemeni, that there are deeper schism now exists in the society along lines that were not known before. We're not talking about tribal lines. We're talking about sectarian, geographic, even in some cases, racial lines that uh, now exist in the country. So this is the, the normative background to human rights issues. Now, I think it's worthwhile noting that during the, uh, the transition, or at least the revolution in the Portland Revolution 2011, uh, everybody was quite surprised that Yemenis did not necessarily use an awful lot of violence to change the regime, even though Yemen is, has one of the highest ratios of uh, armament. And, I mean, I think at the time, Yemen was second to the US in terms of the number of arms per capita in, in that sense. Um, and I think a lot of people realized, actually, that at the time, that the, the country still had a bit more of core values that existed that did not necessarily uh, allow for the kind of mayhem that exists today. But that's, again, another really bad sign of breakdown of some of the value systems that used to exist uh, in, in, in the country. Um, let me, for the last part, highlight some of the main human rights violations that we reported on and we continue to, to observe. The first category I will focus on, those are potential crimes against international law. Those will be crimes of the highest order. One day, we hope that those who committed them will be held accountable. One, uh, I think there is the killing of civilians as a result of either airstrikes, which is the main cause, but also there is indiscriminate shelling, uh, mainly by the Houthis, that cause a lot of destruction of civilians. Um, for our work, we counted 4, 000, uh, around 4,200 civilian death. But here's the, the kicker. Those are the ones that we individually verified. This is not the total number of civilian deaths in Yemen, which is estimated to be uh, at least 15,000. Just to explain to you, because for us, when we report on civilian death, that simply means we verified actually that person died through medical certificate, visit to the morgue, or speaking to the witnesses. We have our own ways of verification. So those are the ones that we counted, uh, and we don't have always access to all of the country in that sense. Uh, the number of injured is uh, a lot far much more than that. The second category of serious crimes is the use of civilians as human shields. Now, this has been difficult for us to report on, but we're fairly confident that we have a number of incidents where civilians are used as human shields, either deploying military installations within residential areas or civilian areas, or in some cases, displacing people to areas that are likely to be a target of, of airstrikes. The third, um, the third uh, serious crime is the recruitment of child soldiers. Uh, now, that's uh, quite a serious issue in Yemen. And again, in our case, we managed to record that means we verified individually uh, more than 1,400 cases. Again, those are not the number of child soldiers that exist in Yemen. Please do not confuse that. Those are the ones that we are really sure that actually we verified individually. The numbers are a lot higher. Now, we often are given justifications that um, there is a cultural element here. People like to volunteer their male children to fight, or in some cases, and don't laugh because this is something that has been told to us numerously. Yemenis look a lot younger than uh, what they appear, and therefore, somebody I see that could be 14 years, the argument is, um, the argument is that uh, this person is older, which is, our response is that this is what we call a crime of strict liability 
whether there's a cultural norm, whether Yemenis look younger or older, whatever it is, recruitment of somebody under 18 years of old is a crime under international law, period. There is no, absolutely no room for justification in that sense. Fourth, destruction of civilian objects. Uh, and here we're concerned about four things that we notice that have been targeted. Dwellings of citizens, but also hospitals, schools. And then the fourth category is heritage sites. And now um, I acknowledge the presence of my colleague, Ms. Anna Paulini, who's sitting there. She's the director of UNICEF, uh, UNESCO's office for the Gulf states and Yemen. And we work together in actually documenting the number of world heritage sites. Many people do not necessarily realize Yemen is one of those ancient civilization countries that has deep, deep roots in uh, history and has a long history. And as a result, there is a number of, large number of historic sites go back all the way to, uh, um, time is out, or one minute? OK. Um, there's uh, sexual uh, and gender-based violence, but that's underreported. And I can further elaborate on that uh, during the discussion. There is also a question of forced displacement. And then there is also a question of denial or diversion of humanitarian assistance. Those are the serious crimes under international law. Other human rights violations include mass arrests. There is a serious targeting of journalists. There is also uh, targeted killings of imam in the, uh, imams in the south that has been fairly prevalent in the last uh, few days. There is also attacking of minorities, namely the Baha'is and, and some Ahmadis. And then there is rampant violations of economic, social, and cultural rights. I mentioned hospitals and a school, therefore education and right to health are violated. But the most serious issue that I want to end up with is that there is um, a stifling blockade that has been imposed on Yemen, and that is the closure of the airport. Uh, uh, and as a result, uh, in the north, there is no access to the outside world. There is a shortage of a lot of the essential goods. And, and, and I think there is always a looming risk of famine uh, uh, as a result. Um, I will stop here and maybe I'll leave some, some room for question. Uh, sorry for exceeding two, two minutes. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thanks. I'm going to follow up now with a couple of underreported aspects of what's going on in Yemen. Much of the media attention has been on the incredibly catastrophic and super important humanitarian crisis. But there is a lot of reporting on this. The figures are available. And so I'd like to talk to you instead about two things. The first is Al-Qaeda. Where is it? How did it get there? Where is it going next? And Islamic State in Yemen. And the second is, how does the conflict look in the east of the country, so away from Sana'a and Aden in the west of the country, 1,000 kilometers to the east, what's going on there? So I'll start with Al-Qaeda. It's important to understand how it gains traction. How does it gain popularity? Well, of course, it resurged absolutely at the same time as the war started, the international intervention by the Saudi-led coalition in March 2015 saw the resurgence of Al-Qaeda in the east of the country. And it ran a state for a whole year until April 2016, when United Arab Emirates and US Special Forces pushed it out. How was it able to do that? We often ask the wrong question in our intelligence services, uh, in our security services, etc., in academia. We're always asking, how are people radicalized? Why do they join the Mujahideen? In Yemen, this wasn't the case. People were not joining the Mujahideen. They were simply tolerating Al-Qaeda. Even at its height, Al-Qaeda only had about 4,000 fighters. And yet, it was able to influence, not exactly control, a massive area of the country. 
that included about 4 million inhabitants. This was not because people were joining the Mujahideen. This is because Al-Qaeda was stepping in to the vacuum that was left by the government. The country was in chaos, and it took advantage of a war in the West. I undertook a survey in the east of Yemen in 2012-2013, and one of the answers that was really interesting was that only 21% of respondents believed that their religious leaders should have a say in all matters of life. And yet, these were the areas where Al-Qaeda entrenched and where it gained popularity. But as you can see, there was no natural appetite for religious rule. So something else must have been happening. When I analyzed Al-Qaeda's governance Twitter feed, I analyzed every single tweet. I noticed that 56% of all of its tweets were about community development projects. Again, stepping into the vacuum left by government. Only 3% of its tweets were about the hudud punishments of Islamic law. And yet, it was that 3% of tweets that all the international media and security organizations and intel orgs were focusing on. And the problem with that was that it meant that the response to terrorism was skewed. It meant that the response was violent. And so, for example, last year, the United States conducted 131 drone and airstrikes in Yemen. What Al-Qaeda had been doing to gain popularity, though, was, of course, community development. So this would be a far more sensible way of tackling the problem long term. At the same time, Al-Qaeda made local government partnerships. It had a program of youth outreach. And it tried to harness its agenda of global jihad onto local problems and local history. All of this worked really well for it while it was in charge. By contrast, Islamic State in Yemen was nowhere on this. Islamic State in Yemen had a brief surge of popularity in 2014, but after that, it, it dwindled. It didn't manage to form alliances with tribes in the east of Yemen. Basically, it was considered foreign. It was considered alien. It was considered too violent. It didn't latch onto local problems, but came straight in with a global jihad agenda. And e even those fighting with the Mujahideen complained about Islamic State. They said their fighters are lazy, they don't get up before lunchtime, and when they do go and fight, they're more interested in taking photos of themselves with their guns and posting them on their social media than they are about tackling the Houthis. So for all of these reasons, Islamic State didn't take off. But what's happening now? Well, the United Arab Emirates has been successful with help from the US in severely denting Al-Qaeda's capacity to operate. But it hasn't gone away. What happens is that it tends to move. It moves from place to place, and it goes underground. So stories in the Gulf media, when Al-Qaeda was ousted from Mukalla, 800 fighters dead, etc. this simply wasn't true. And this has also been the case with recent operations, Operation Al-Faisal in February, um, Operation uh, Black Mountains at the end of April, beginning of May this year. The suspicion is that Al-Qaeda simply pushed from one place to the next place. That said, it is important that its ability to operate has been severely impaired. We're seeing much less on the Telegram feeds. Its media output is way down. And we know that it's in trouble from its own statements. In January, it released a spy film, which was almost feature length, complaining about 
uh, lots of people giving it away about how well plugged in counter-terrorism forces were to gossip. Uh, they advised, don't even tell your wife what's going on with the Mujahideen. She'll just tell other people. We'll all get droned. Um, you know, they're under severe pressure. They have put out strong statements condemning local tribes for allowing their sons to sign up with the UAE militias, the UAE security forces in the south. What, what's happening now, though, is that within the groups themselves, within Islamic State and Al-Qaeda, we're seeing evidence of fragmentation. That doesn't mean that we're winning the war against counterterrorism. But we're on the way. What it means is that it's more difficult to identify because the groups are splitting up. The labels, Al-Qaeda and Islamic State, are no longer as relevant as they were. They're more labels that we put on it. Mm. And what that means is that there's a bit more blending, a bit more to and fro between the groups. Both groups are still very active on the same battlefront in Haifa, in al Baida, And really, they're becoming more like gangs with greater links to organized crime. We've actually had complaints internally uh, from disgruntled Al-Qaeda Sheikh, one in particular, that says that he's been publishing a series called 100 Reasons Why the Brothers Are, are Corrupt. He's been complaining that the Mujahideen know more um, these days about Nasheeds than they do about the Quran. So definitely they're under pressure. I mentioned the links to organized crime, and I have about one minute to finish off, maybe two minutes. This is where the east of the country comes into the equation. The east of Yemen is really important here because it has been the conduit, the entry point for a lot of illicit weaponry and drugs, and indeed humans fleeing ISIS fighters into Yemen. And the smuggling networks have been allowed to grow and flourish in the east of the country in cahoots with, in cooperation with members of Al-Qaeda providing security cover. This happened very likely, according to my interviews in Yemen, in the east, in August last year, in collaboration with local government authorities. There are many people getting rich on the back of this war. So even when you're nominally fighting the Houthis, you might still be making money importing weapons to those same Houthis. And that has meant that international players have now moved in. There are basically three big issues happening in the east of Yemen. The first is the smuggling, the organized crime. The second are the international players that have now got involved. This is Saudi Arabia moving into Al Mahra in December. UAE, very active on Socotra. And also Oman, which has more deep historical ties in the east of the country, now supporting uh, would be Sultan of Al Mahra and Socotra. So we've got three international players there. And the third issue in the East, this is my final point, are the separatist movements. It's very easy to think that the East of Yemen is part of the Southern problem and that it will be solved by being dealt with along with the Southern problem. That is not the case. There are separate movements happening in the East of Yemen. There is one for Greater Hadramaut, there's an independence movement for Mahra and Socotra, which does not want to be part of Greater Hadramaut. And there's a nascent one on Socotra itself. So, even if the South breaks away, even if secession happens, and I'm quite sympathetic to the history of the South, this will not mean peace within the South. I think it will be a harbinger, a, a breeder, of further conflict and further problems inside the former South. Thank you very much. Well, uh, a very complex web of actors and problems. Um, <laughs> but uh, you mentioned, you know, no, no framework for a political transition was uh, sort of key to where Yemen is t 
today, for a key reason why, why Yemen is where it is today. Um, crimes, human rights violations, verification, challenges, um, polarization, exclusive governments that, you know, whose legitimacy is questionable, lack of accountability, and uh, the importance of Eastern Yemen and the ability of groups such as Al-Qaeda to bounce back after every setback and sort of the, the moving parts, as you mentioned, Elizabeth. But uh, let me start with you. Um, so you, you were a member of the National Dialogue Conference. Um, to what extent do you think that the, the process itself was inherently flawed? And do you think that it played a, a larger role than you described um, in, in where Yemen is today? I mean, there were, there were, there were certainly some problems there when, in terms of representation of the South, of the Houthis, of women, of uh, the youth. Um, to what extent do you think that should the NDC, the National Dialogue Conference, serve um, as a basis for, for renewed negotiations in Yemen? That's my first question to you. My second question is uh, on this issue of polarization. The Yemenis are, of course, extremely polarized, um, especially over the last three, four years. Um, how do you suggest that this polarization be addressed? Um, in particular, since the Hadi government um, and its sort of credibility in the eyes of Yemenis is, is, is really quite weak, um, what are the alternatives to, to the Hadi government? Okay. Um, I think um, definitely the national dialogue uh, was not the um, perfect framework. Um, but it was definitely more inclusive than all political uh, discussions that happened in Yemen in the past. It was the first time that you have people coming from across the country, uh, from all provinces, uh, to participate in the process. And it was the biggest form of consultations we had, I think, in decades. Um, usually, uh, when we have a um, political crisis in, inside Yemen, the decision is re really um, comes back to very, very few people. Very few people who would meet and finally decide how this thing will be uh, will be resolved and how can we move how can we move uh, how can we move uh, move forward. Uh, and I think this is where the importance of the of the uh, of the of the national dialogue uh, uh, national dialogue comes, is that you we had a a a, a process that is saying discussed the problems. So of course Elizabeth mentioned, for example, the issues of the eastern provinces. Um, when we met people from Al Mahara, people from Sada, people from Hajja, um, everyone has the, that desire that they have felt they have been. There is some grievances. They have been neglected. There is no inclusivity. They haven't been shared. That's why we suggested federalism as the basis. And I, from here, step into the into 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 your question about polarization. Uh, polarization is a result of an ongoing uh, local grievances that have been accumulated over uh, over many 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 years. Um, the Houthi movement itself, it is an accumulation of local grievances that have allowed to accumulate from 2004 until 2009. If those grievances maybe were dealt in a different way in 2004, and the southern movement was dealt in, a, the, the issue of the south was dealt since it came, um, came out in 2007 at least, um, of course, we would have we would have avoided many of the uh, many of the conflicts uh, today. Um, I went to Sada in 2008, um, and that was during the uh, um, I think 2007. Sorry, that was during the fourth war. And um, one of the things that I remember is that um, whenever I used to talk to the to the to the to the Houthis, um, they were children. First of all, those are 11, 12 years old children who don't really uh, understand the issue when, um, and the, the people like their mentor who's, who's leading them, don't really click with me when I talk to him about national unity, our, our Yemeni values, our traditions. Um, those have been living in war. Now, if I imagine move forward 10 years from now, those children, 12, there were 12 maybe back then, now they're 22. All what they have experienced in life is war. 
That's what they've seen. This is life for them. So for us, people living in Sana'a didn't maybe feeling this is so weird, this is strange, how, how, how can a conflict is going, is going on for too long. For them, that that's has been their life for, like for, the last, uh, for the last 10 years. They don't have childhood that they haven't, and they don't see any other, uh, any, any, uh, any other, uh, other future. The importance of the national dialogue is that it sets a framework that says this is a alternative, peaceful method to the conflict. We are in a conflict because there is a lack of that transition. And that's, that's, the, that's, that's my always, let's say, argument when I, when I see a lot of criticism on the, on the, on the national dialogue. Of course, it's not, a, a, a very, like, it's not the most perfect uh, scenario. Of course, we would have loved to have further consultations. Of course, we would like to have more southern voices and more youth voices and more civil society voices. But it is far more inclusive than any ever process that we had in the past. The, set, the third thing which is very important is that when the uh, Houthis came and we were negotiating with them, uh, we were uh, challenging them on one, um, based on one factor. We said, if you think that the Yemeni people don't want the outcomes of the national dialogue, then allow for a referendum. This is the decisive moment. If the Yemeni people voted yes, then that's how the Yemeni people want. And this is how the process should look like. And then we should move toward federalism because that's the will of the Yemeni people. And if they decided no, then we go back into, into the consultations. And the way it was shaped is that we have consultations, we go into referendum. If the people said no, we go back and then we discuss the uh, points of the, of, the, uh, of the resolution where the people said no. And then we go back for referendum again and again and again until we, we, we reach a final uh, a final, a final, uh, final outcomes. People have separatist movements for many reasons, and you're going to have people in the in Mahara calling for secession, people in Sakatra feeling they're neglected, people in the south, people in Aden. Uh, when I went to to Hajjah and meeting the people in my in my in my province, they were saying we don't have an issue. We want to the same as the southern issue. You and the national dialogue adopt the Hajjah issue because we have also been uh, been uh, been neglected. The issue to resolve this was federalism because they it allows for participation in the, in the, uh, the uh, decision-making process, and it allows uh, a share of the, of, the, of the wealth. And that's the core of the Yemeni conflict, the distribution of wealth and power that people felt has not been fairly distributed for many, many years. Okay, thank you. Mm. Dr. Al-Aved, yes. um, now, I know you said that you made a distinction between the political organs of the UN and, and the human rights organs, but I'm not gonna let you off the hook that easily. Um, I tried. Yes, you tried. Okay, so, well, first of all, uh, breaches of international humanitarian law, international human rights law, and so on, um, clearly, you know, there's, there's, there are some very serious crimes that have been identified as being perpetrated in Yemen. And you yourself have you know, referred to the problem of the lack of accountability and the very long history of the lack of accountability in Yemen. So, okay, three years on, nobody has been held to account. Of course, the investigations are still ongoing, but even once responsibility has been identified, the, 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 the perpetrators responsible for these crimes uh, or the suspects, what, how will, they be, how will they actually be held to account? Um, what, is, what is the feasibility there? What, what is the likelihood there? Um, is there a risk in raising the expectations of, of, of Yemeni victims in terms of you know, promising for the, uh, the pursuit of justice? Um, so implementing that accountability, um, how, do you, how do you envision that happening? Um, secondly, the, one of the former U.S. ambassadors to Yemen, Stephen Sesh, uh, recently criticized the, um, the, the UN, UN Security Council Resolution 2216 and saying, you know, this, this was passed several years ago. Um, it, is no longer, it no longer adequately reflects the situation on the ground in Yemen, and the UN needs to issue a new Security Council resolution um, to, to, to better address the, the current reality on the ground. Meanwhile, another U.S., uh, former U.S. ambassador to Yemen, Gerald Feuerstein, um, uh, very recently, in light of what's happening in Socotra, 
um, said that the same UN Security Council resolution 2216 legitimizes uh, uh, the Arab coalition's intervention and calls for, quote, the defense of the legitimate government, i.e. the Hadi government, and respect for Yemen's unity and territorial integrity. Any departure from those principles is illegitimate and should be rejected. And of course, he was here also referring to the uh, Emirati presence, uh, military presence on the island of Socotra. So on the one hand, the UN Security Council resolution is invoked, and on the other hand, it is uh, uh, um, rejected and, and called for it to be scrapped. So should the UN be changing its approach here? Um, the, the, the first question is the question of accountability. I think, again, I mean, I'll just add to what you said. Any future project in, for political reconciliation in Yemen have to address the issue of accountability. Because I think one of the complexities associated with the conflict in Yemen is the massive number of victims that exist. And as a result, the massive number of individuals who would be interested in seeking or exacting justice at some point. So understanding that dynamic is very essential. Uh, that's, that's the first issue. The second issue is uh, in terms of when it comes to accountability, I think what we do is a long-term solution. The value of what we do is we do as much as we can to document human rights violations so that one day that this information will be put to use and those people will be held accountable. Uh, and that's something that we cannot guarantee. But, uh, and, and, and I really appreciate your point about actually um, heightening the expectations of the victims because there's always a danger uh, associated with that. Uh, i.e. giving high hopes and then dashing them, which means we contribute a lot more misery to the victims in addition to what they're going through. Um, so we're very careful not to make any unrealistic expectations. But when the time comes, there have to be two levels of accountability. There are crimes definitely require an international mechanism to deal with them. I think the Human Rights Council has already started this by having the group of eminent experts. Now, eventually, their reports will continue recommendations that in this particular crime here and there, there should be a more international justice being affected. The second level, of course, will be internal. The majority of cases will have to be handled internally. Now, that's going to be complicated. But any solution to Yemen cannot skip two things. One, accountability, and the second one, a very strong commitment to core human rights. You mentioned equal participation in the management of public space, equality and non-discrimination, protection of security of the, of, the, of the persons and property and all of those things. Those are things now becoming very essential in Yemen. So that's your first question. I think the second question is, is what you'll be interested in actually that the Houthis make the point that 2216 is obsolete. No, not just the American ambassador you cited. And the basis for that is actually, it did not recognize them as an actual partner uh, in the conflict. And as a result, it identified Hadi's government as the only legitimate government. Um, so in that sense, but everybody recognized actually they are an effective element on the ground. So they have to be a part of any solution. Now, here is the issue of the polarization comes in before the UN can do anything. Because what the dynamic you have now, you have two misguided beliefs on both sides. On the side of the legitimate government, there is an understanding now that actually they could restore the governance of Yemen without in the inclusion of the Houthis. Because now they are identified as the other or the foreigners. They're Iranians or Farsi or whatever it is. That's, so that's the first mistake on that side. On the side of the Houthis, the longer they stay in power, the longer control they have, the longer they believe that actually they can rule the entire country, which is never going to happen in terms of the current processes and ideology that exists and the polarization in the country. So when the two of them realize that actually 
the Houthis are not going anywhere, they're Yemenis, and they have to be part of any political so solution. And when the Houthis realize actually that they, there is no way in hell that they can rule the country on the basis of their current ideology, then that could be a dynamic that could lead to, uh, to a new, perhaps, arrangement. Now, the second point, which I was the, the uh, Firestein, I think, is that uh, I think from a legal point of view, it's not true that the resolution legitimized the use of force, a collective use of force in Yemen. No. That, here comes the value of Hadi government. It was actually a Hadi government as an official representative of the sovereign. They invited those countries to come and help them um, uh, protect the country from the intrusions of the, of the Houthis. And this is, might explain to you the complexity of the conflict, why Hadi is indispensable at this point. Because if he pulled the trigger and he withdrew that particular uh, invitation, then there is no legal basis for collective use of force in Yemen. And that's why I think sometimes the dynamics are as such that you might not necessarily have clarity, but what's more frustrating, people are passing the buck. Uh, around, and, and that's what I think is realistic, uh, is, is, is a real tragedy in Yemen. Meanwhile, the other complexing reality is that everybody is almost convinced that they are not going to win this war. Either side you look at. But nobody is willing to find a solution to the other side because there is this very immature that sense that I want a face-saving way out. I did not spend all of this money and destroy the whole country to leave and let the Houthis reign. Or for the Houthis, we did not mount all of this religious fervor and ideology and dogma to finally secede and become just part of the, of, of, of the equation and we be treated the same way as before. And, but both of them, I think, have clear ideas that this is not a war anybody is going to win. The losers in this case are the Yemenis who continue to die originally from the airstrikes and, and now actually from diseases. Mm -hmm. In addition to the cholera, you have a diphtheria epidemic starting. You have malnutrition. Yeah. And eventually, I think, you might have a, a famine in a larger sense. And then there is a larger catastrophe looming on the horizon, the return of 700,000 Yemenis from Saudi Arabia, which means that those are people who are sustaining as much as they can, a few millions in Yemen. You can imagine the devastating effect of, of that particular added element uh, to what is happening. So unfortunately, I think for the for this Security Council to move, the movers and the shakers of the council have to realize yeah. that the Yemenis are also human beings, like many others, and they're worth saving, and they're worth actually protecting. And it is possible to do that. Uh, and I'm not sure, I, I think, I don't wanna say that there is a need for new resolution to give people the justification that until that happens, whatever. I think it's valid to argue within 12, 2016, you can do an awful lot to stop what is happening. So it's not necessarily uh, something that you can actually say until that is being changed, nothing should happen in Yemen. I think that has been a fallacy projected. I think there's a lot, same as the NDC as what he said, there's so many valid elements if you implement them, until then you can go to the uh, right. uh, solution. Thank you. Um, before we turn to the audience, quick question uh, for you, Elizabeth. Um, clearly the counterterrorism strategy is not working. Um, how can, it, how can this policy be changed, and who do you think is well-placed to push for this change? Hmm. So the counter-terrorism policy is working to an extent. It's definitely managed to impair the operations of al-Qaeda, but it, it's, it's simply that it will never completely go away and it, and it keeps moving around. But credit where credit is due. The problems with it, the things that need changing are the looking at what al-Qaeda itself has done in order to win recruits. What does it do? 
it identifies local problems and tries to address them. Or at least it looks like it does that. And it manages to move into vulnerable areas that are left fragile by weak government. So turn those things around. That will help them to stop them spread. But the other thing is that alongside the force practices, the violence that's being wrought on al-Qaeda, are other practices which help al-Qaeda to keep recruiting. And by that, I mean that the UAE counter-terrorism forces are also uh, practicing detentions, forced arrests, disappearances, assassination of imams, secret prisons, and torture. Don't just take my word for it. This appears in the UN report of the panel of experts as well. This is documented. These kinds of strategies might work short term, but they build up long term resentment, which terrorist groups can exploit. And at the same time, it's too easy to mix up a counter terrorism agenda with other agendas, which may be political and commercial. And it's important for those who are involved in the Yemen conflict, such as the UAE, Saudi Arabia, etc., to be transparent about their aims. Let me give you one example. I'll keep it really short. Please. The major counter-terror operation that began last year in August was in Shabwa. And that was supposed to be a huge effort to uproot al-Qaeda in Yemen. If you, as I do, log every single al-Qaeda attack, you will have noted that during 2017, until the 1st of August, there were 169 al-Qaeda attacks, operations in Yemen. One of them was in Shabwa, just one. But Shabwa is the home to Yemen's only gas pipeline and natural gas supply. Al-Qaeda is mainly located in Al-Baidah. Counter-terrorism forces are being recruited and used mainly across Hadramaut, Shabwa, now Al-Mahra, and we also have the Monsacotra. So there is clearly an agenda at work here which is not purely counter-terrorism. Okay, thank you very much. All right, so uh, I'll take three questions to start. Um, Justin, so let's start with this side. So um, in the back there, please. And, yeah. Uh, thank you, thank you all for your... Uh, please introduce yourself. Sorry, uh, Justin Alexander. Um, thank you all for your uh, contributions and I think anyone who hears more about Yemen just feels a sense of fury at everyone involved um, and longs for a solution. Um, a number of the comments you've made have talked about the regional identities and the senses of disenfranchisement and the idea that a federal solution is what's necessary eventually. But I, I believe that one of the factors that led to the breakdown in the start of 2015 between the Houthis and Hadi was over the model of federalism and the way the regions are defined. So my question is, what kind of federalism would be workable and address people's concerns and what kind of process, what chances are there of the new UN envoy leading a process that gets us there? Thank you. Thank you, Justin. Okay. Um, in the middle there, please. Right there. Dr. Sadiq Abu Nafisa, Merkaz Dirasat al Strategia, Huat al Musallaha. Awalan Tushkaru ala. هذه القضية قضية منسية قضية اليمن رغم المآسي الموجودة وأعتقد أن الولايات المتحدة تعلم أن حلفائها الأساسيين السعودية والإمارات هم رأس الحرب في الفوضى الجارية والعمل لا إنسانية أعتقد في رأيي الشخصي أن قضية اليمن الآن خارج في رأيي الشخصي خارج أي تحول سوري خارج أي علاج ما لم يكن هنالك علاج عالمي مجلس الأمن يجب أن يعتبر اليمن فيرد ستيت دولة فاشلة 
يجب أن تدخل في البند السابع وبعد ذلك تعالج تعالج مسألة الحكم في داخل اليمن بمرحلة انتقالية تشرف عليها الأمم المتحدة زي ما حصل في بلاد كثيرة فدا بفتكر الاقتراح الحق يحصل لأن المسألة هذه لا يمكن أن تحل عن طريق السعودية والإمارات ولا عن طريق الحوثيين فيتزدد لوك يعني هذا ما أراه يعني شكرا شكرا Uh, thank you very much. I'm Nora Dean from Doha Institute for Graduate Studies. Um, in any state in the Middle East, um, when the central power really collapses, people go to the sub identities, sub national identities. And um, we can see that, that in Yemen. What, for my in my opinion, I think what's happening in Yemen, it's not a war, it's wars. So there are many levels of the war. And in order to, to solve that, you have to address all these levels. So, but my question is about the national, Iran national deal and what happened yesterday and how it will intensify, or maybe not, the war in Yemen. Because in, in a way or another, the war in Yemen is a proxy war in a, le in a level of it. Yeah, there is like a national level of it, but there is another regional. The other thing is what the UN wants to do, because the UN, and this is one of my criticisms to the UN work in, in general, they usually cares more about ceasefire and agreements, and because that's what media really reports, but they don't really go more to the like reconciliation and normalization between the ties, because that doesn't make really any news for the media. And the other thing is, for Al-Qaeda in, in the East Yemen. Don't you think that the drones, the attacks that carried out by the Americans, makes another source of recruitment for the Al-Qaeda? Because when a drone killed, in a tribal society, killed you know, people's families, that makes them, makes them really want to, you know, to revenge for them. And um, the last question is about accountability. Can the UN really set everyone accountable in Yemen? That means Saudis, Americans, and all just the poor uh, Yemenis. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, brief responses, please, so we can take more, more questions from the audience. A question about federalism and the new UN envoy, and uh, the UN Security Council declaring Yemen a failed state, and then uh, I, I believe he also mentioned Chapter 7, uh, and the Iran deal and proxy, the, the, the whole proxy war angle of this. Uh, who would like to start? Federalism, would you like to start with the federalism question? Yeah. Go ahead. Um, I, think, um, I think the issue about um, not agreeing to federalism uh, came after they took control uh, of uh, Sana'a, the capital. Uh, it meant simply that they, they can dictate what kind of shape, uh, what kind of resolution um, that, uh, that, should, uh, that should look like. And um, what kind of federalism, how does it look like? I think eventually you'll need to have further consultations and make it finally through a referendum. The final shape is what the Yemeni people want, uh, how, um, how, how, it, how they want it to look like. I think the danger about what happened, and I think this is where um, many people didn't see as uh, what happened in September 2014 as the beginning of the of the a, be a real beginning of the of the of the conflict. It meant that there is no uh, polit there is no a viable political solution because you have an armed force that can dictate what is the shape of the uh, what's the shape of of uh, for, uh, federalism, for instance. The Houthis only refused federalism after they took Sanaa. So they said, "We want to get back to the." Old way, the central, uh, the central form of uh, uh, central form of uh, uh, central form of governance, and I think this is quite quite the uh, quite the challenge. For me, I think it's unacceptable for you, but just because you have force or you can dictate or you've uh, taken control over the capital, they can dictate what kind of federalism 
will uh, should uh, should uh, should uh, should look uh, should, do, uh, should look like. What should have happened is that it should gone gone through referendum, and if the people rejected that f f form of uh, of, uh, of federalism, then there gets back to further consultations until we get back to the final uh, to the final uh, to the final uh, to the final uh, to the final pro uh, final product, and that's quite quite of the the root causes, like the local causes of the of the of the of the conflict. Some people argue there is proxy uh, uh, proxy reasons, but th this was one of the main sticking issues of why. The Yemen transition couldn't uh, couldn't uh, uh, couldn't uh, I couldn't move uh, couldn't move uh, move uh, move uh, move uh, move forward. So I think again it's a similar response to what I what I uh, what I what I told you. Um, a, a, a a a a political solution should be based again, and I agree with most of what, what Mr. Al Obaid mentioned. Should be based on compromise. Both sides should agree at a certain time that there needs to be a political resolution. This means that the Houthis can't dictate the political solution through the use of force. So, so they need to agree to a, a military and security con, uh, uh, concession. And in exchange, as Mr. Obeid rightfully said, the other side should agree that the Houthis are, are going to be there. The Houthis are not going anywhere, and they are going to be part of any uh, form of new uh, 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 um, uh, 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 any new government that comes, and then what happens next is for the for the Yemeni people to decide whether it's federalism or who they who, who they elect. If the people want the Houthis, then they can vote for them. If they don't want them, then they just don't 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 vote for them. Thank you. Okay. ما يمكن أن تقوم به الأمم المتحدة أستاذ الصادق أنا بفتكر أنه في نقاش موجود داخل اليمن وفي يمني الحل في الغالب The solution in general is going to be an internal solution more than an external solution Unfortunately, it is very clear for the international community that interest in Yemen is very weak. Uh, interest in countries such as the Sudan or any other countries is very limited or very weak. Uh, unfortunately, due to the economic and human value, their value is not important enough uh, to be uh, compared to other conflict zones. At the end of the day, all the conflicting parties, particularly the Yemeni ones, uh, they have relations with the foreign entities and the use of violence that we see now on the ground by the coalition forces is the reason is that there is a statement by the uh, legitimate government that there should be such a force to be used. It is not the United Nations nor the Security Council. So the solution might be very simple indeed. If Yemenis themselves, uh, that they do not want to have any intervention in their own country, external intervention by a neighboring country or a brotherly country or any other country, if they try to sit together. I have lived in Yemen for years ago things are changing can change very quickly but the problem now this uh, proxy war that is taking place uh, even the parties to this uh, proxy war the Yemenis would not have enough freedom for them to be able to sit at the table and to find a solution they have what it takes uh, uh, but uh, the presence of such a capability with the uh, weakness of the situation internationally would make the opportunity of uh, an internal solution would be much more feasible and much quicker and uh, even the question that you posed that the United Nations uh, should impose ceasefire uh, this is not only done like that if we cannot solve the main problem at least we should stop the killing because we do not want to have more people that are going to be dead or more people that are going to be injured yes we would like to have a lasting solution or a sustainable solution but in the uh, in the absence of such kind of solutions this is going to be also important federalism i personally believe that this is a solution and that it would be able to encompass separatist movements if it were explained and if it were arranged in a way that reflected general popular opinion. That raises the question, who speaks for the people? This is always the problem. 
who is it who decides? Another Majlis of Sheikhs, another committee of 14 people, a bunch of foreigners, the United Nations. There has to be the kind of process that Barat described, a kind of referendum. People have to speak for themselves. Yemen, a failed state, definitely. When you have three would-be governments, Hadi in Riyadh, the Houthis in Sana'a, the southern separatists in Aden, and none of them control the country, I think we can call it a failed state. Multiple wars, yes. Iran's role, I think that has reached saturation point. It's unlikely that Iran can get more involved, particularly now that the smuggling routes in the east of the country have been closed up. But bear in mind, Iran's role is done. Its job is done at relatively cheap cost. It supplied weapons and advisors, and it got Saudi Arabia embroiled in a war that it can't win. It's ruined its international reputation and it's harried it financially. So Iran doesn't really need to do much more. Al-Qaeda? Well, drones do drive recruitment, but normally on my observation, my talks with people in the east of Yemen, that's much, much, much more the case when they hit the wrong target or when they create collateral damage. There's a more, more of a sense of, well, when a terrorist is traveling between point A and point B on a motorbike or in a car and gets droned, I don't see that many people crying for him. But not that I would wish to condone drone strikes. I do understand that there is a role for force when countering terrorism. I think that was it. Thank you. We have time for just a couple more questions. Are there any women who have questions? <laughs> no. Mia, and uh, let's, Mia, I'll get, I'll get to you in a second. Let's start with the lady in the back here, please. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Brandy, and I was wondering at what point do you see or how do you see the international community being able to actually functionally respond to some of the more practical on the ground civilian issues as far as actually getting the aid to the point where it needs to be versus kind of dropping it and hoping that it reaches the right person. Thank you. Uh, over here and then Mia. So let's here in the front, please. I think what's going in Yemen is something ridiculous. Houthi are Yemeni, and Saudis with alliance of nine countries are interfering in Yemen. They are not Yemenis. The most ridiculous thing that those people who are fighting in Yemen to restore legitimacy are supporting the coup d'etat in, in Egypt, which is against legitimacy. And this who was subverting legitimacy in Egypt is supporting legitimacy in Yemen. Something ridiculous, please. Who can explain this for me? Okay. I think what is going in Yemen is something very strange. Uh, big powers or free world is supporting Saudi Arabia's and, and violating all of what they think about human rights, dignity, only because they are brokers selling arms. What is your $70 question? $70 million dollar mm -hmm. can, till can, now. Can you state your I question, think, please? Yeah. OK, mm -hmm. thank you. All right. Mia, over here. Yep. Go ahead. Oh, OK. <laughs> um, no, no, I was just wondering about your, your title for this evening, right? Um, calling this a tragic war. So. All, all wars are tragic, right? So I would be interested in the speaker's views on what makes Yemen particularly tragic. All Is right. it perhaps more tragic? Okay, thank you. So on the question of aid delivery, uh, yeah. Al-Abid, would you like to, sure. to tackle this question? How do you separate the humanitarian from the, from the political? <laughs> Um, uh, I think that has been working with a great degree of difficulty, but it has been working. This is one area that um, I think 
we, we still have serious issues of access, and that's uh, my colleagues who work for the Office of Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, OCHA, uh, works more on this. But Yemen now has one of the biggest budgets for humanitarian assistance in the world. Um, the issues of access we have is the delays, first of all, this blockade, and also the inspection of the ships coming in and whatever, there's a lot of delays that are happening. As I said earlier, there are issues of diversion of humanitarian assistance, but there's also issues of some degree of corruption uh, of, of, of uh, humanitarian, but it's reaching uh, a, lot of, a, lot of, uh, a lot of people. But definitely more political will is needed to make sure that actually more access is granted by both sides. But, but uh, the Houthis need to uh, grant a lot more access for sure, uh, other than the other side. Uh, but that requires political will. Um, uh, so in that sense, uh, again, when countries flex a little bit more muscles and realize that, um, as I said, Yemen is just as human beings as anybody else. Uh, they, they need to be saved, or at least they need to have access to food. And the food is available, actually. It's not necessarily not, uh, it's, it's not uh, too scarce in that sense. Can I add my two final senses to why this is tragic? Sure. sure. Um, uh, again, I think the tragedy of Yemen comes from the fact that we see it in front of our eyes, and nobody seems to care much enough to do something to put an end to something that is a lot easier to put an end to than other crises. The second problem is why this is more tragic. As I said to you, the number of diseases, now we've seen even diseases that have been eliminated in the world, they're coming back because of the contamination of the water sources, because of the problems relating to water supply and a lot of things. And when you see the amount of misery that people go through, it's a slow death. People's stocks are now being exhausted. There is no financial resources. There is no salaries. There is no income that's coming in. A lot of people are being now repatriated back, who used to be the source of income. The tragedy is we're seeing this place in front of our eyes in a fairly clear way. And as I said, they seem to be just in the degree of indifference that nobody is willing to, uh, to explain. Thank you. Thank you. Final, some final comments, uh, Bara and Elizabeth? Okay. Um, I think quickly on what, um, what the international community uh, can, uh, can, uh, can do. Um, I think um, here we're going to go back to the issue of um, when um, uh, discussions revolve around Yemen. Um, usually counterterrorism come in the forefront. And um, uh, I'm a Yemeni myself. I have investigated drone strikes across Yemen. I went to the areas where people claim there is like high presence of, of, uh, of, uh, of Al-Qaeda in Beida, in Kaifa, in Abyan, in Shabwa, and many parts of the country. The common Yemeni doesn't wake up in the morning and think what Al-Qaeda is, uh, what, what Al is going to do. However, that occupies a lot of space and uh, when um, whoever uh, uh, is uh, discussing uh, internationally what is being done in Yemen. When we see all statements coming out of the Security Council, um, uh, Security Council uh, mem uh, um, um, uh, member states, usually the counterterrorism issue and Al-Qaeda occupies a huge space. It means simply that the priorities of the Yemeni people are not fully addressed by the international, uh, by the international community. Their focus is somewhere else. The regular Yemeni people wake up, as Zoubaid mentions, they're less reg regular human beings. They, how can I, uh, where, where, where can I find food for my children? How can I provide? Can I find for them good education? Can I find for them good, good health care? And I think this is the entire, one of the, one of the issues that people still struggle to understand what does the Yemeni people need? They need what the rest of the people, what the rest of the world wants in this, uh, in this, in their, in their, um, in their, uh, in their daily, uh, in their daily lives. Uh, the other thing I think, we should address when we have a transition or a political uh, transition that could lead to something, we shouldn't allow 
uh, we shouldn't make simply the perfect be the enemy of the good. Mm -hmm. Of course, all political transitions have their flaws. But eventually, who makes the decision? One of the main issues that in Yemen that we couldn't have elections. Um, the people are struggling about who's legitimate and who's illegitimate. Hadi's legitimacy comes simply from because he was the last elected president. If we were allowed to have our elections in 2015, simply, <laughs> simply the, the, the Houthis prevented elections that could have changed the government that they are today complaining from, um, which, which, which simply means Sometimes you have a political transition. We need to allow that political transition to, to, to go forward and then keep, of course, addressing, developing, and changing, and trying to make it better until hopefully we, 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 uh, we reach a, uh, a, a situation uh, where we feel uh, there is good governance, um, uh, good uh, democratic pr uh, practices. And finally, I would to say, um, the issue that Mr. Obaid mentions the core human rights values should be addressed when we discuss the future of, the, of, of, of Yemen's country. And if, you, if anyone have viewed the national dialogue outcomes, the one that we stated when we wanted to have the, the, uh, the referendum, we discussed these issues, the issues of women's rights, press freedom, political participation, uh, 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 civil, uh, civil society. And I think these are just the normal demands of any society who have passed through uh, a, 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 a military dictatorship for the last three decades. They want change, and they are very much aspiring to change. If they're allowed tomorrow a chance for another process, another elections, another referendum, you will see the desire of the Yemeni people coming out. People will come out, they will vote, and they will practice their rights as regular citizens. Thank you. Very briefly. Very briefly, uh, I just want to add something in response to Mia's excellent question. The tragedy of the Yemen war is, of course, the humanitarian aspect. How many times have we read articles where the final paragraph adds on the end, and about 10,000 people have died in this conflict? That figure has not changed for about two years. Why do we keep wheeling it out? It's many, many thousands more than that. So it's hidden. The cost of the conflict is hidden, as Dr. El Abaid also mentioned. Second thing is the humanitarian aspects, the cholera, the potential famine, the diphtheria that are starting to get more attention in the press are now enabling our governments to be distracted by talking about the humanitarian problem instead of trying to solve the actual war. They can sound like heroes by throwing aid conferences instead of actually tackling the major contradictions in their political policies. And by that, I mean deep contradictions, such as those mentioned by this gentleman on the front row here. We are basically interested in Yemen because of counterterrorism, because of trade routes through the Red Sea, and because of very significant income from arms sales to those who are party to the con conflict. So at the same time that we abhor the terrible human cost on the ground, our governments are continuing to support those who are party to the conflict and continuing to sell them weapons which are being used in Yemen. Okay, thank you very much. Um, certainly no, no easy answers. And <laughs> uh, However, I think despite the current um, very difficult and tragic uh, status of affairs in Yemen. I think that our panelists have identified some areas, some possibilities um, uh, where, where some work can be done. Um, uh, please join us for a reception, and please uh, join me in uh, thanking our panelists for an excellent discussion today. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.